MB Power and the RCMP have been on the crash site all day. What we know so far is that the helicopter struck power lines before crashing into the Restigouche River. It happened Sunday around 4 p.m. Egan says in 2012 she was the last person to cross this bridge during the evacuation. And she says ice from the river was actually higher than the deck. They fixed the of municipal this property tax on the terminal to $500,000 per year until 2030. In 2015, St. John Council passed a motion to ask the provincial government for a repeal. That was something championed by now Deputy Mayor Shirley McAleary. The city wrote a letter to the Gallant government saying they couldn't afford it and asked for a fair share. As you can see, there's lots of sand on the sidewalks. The city says they've used more sand this year than the past three years, but they say they're having a hard time keeping up with the changes in temperature. Gallant says he may not agree with everything that Trump has said regarding minorities and women, but says he'll do everything possible to communicate the importance of trade between the two countries and the province. Neighbors we spoke with said they didn't see or hear anything out of the ordinary, but there's a trail of blood leading from the door of the home down the driveway to the street. The couple that live here, Phyllis and Roy Coffin, declined an on-camera interview, but they say they lived in this house for 37 years. Roy was home at the time the fire broke out, and they say other than a laptop, they lost everything. Just days ago, this part of Route 105 was completely covered in water. Now the water's gone, but the road is cracked with pieces of it actually breaking off. And while the app is still fairly new, Call says eventually users will be able to pay with their smartphone instead of putting change in here. With Ellen's Law coming into effect June 1st, we wanted to show a visual representation of exactly how far one meter is on the road. The province's official opposition didn't back off the premier today over the property tax assessment issue, calling again for his resignation. It's all the people are talking about all across New Brunswick. What are they saying? Can be summed up in six simple words. Property tax scandal. Premier must resign. The court of public opinion has been deliberating and the jury of 750,000 has reached a verdict. Resign. The Tories say the decision to fast track the new property tax assessment system and roll it out faster than planned was the problem. They say that pressured Service New Brunswick to use invented renovations to raise people's taxes. They say the Premier's office was involved and want the Premier to take responsibility. The Premier says there have been problems for years, saying those problems need to be fixed. And that's exactly what we're going to do as the government, Mr. Speaker, and that's why uh, we, as you may know, Mr. Speaker, a few weeks ago announced that we would be taking the following actions to ensure that we fix this problem once and for all. The Premier recited the government's six-step plan, including an independent comprehensive review by a former federal court judge. We have asked former Justice Robertson to go through what happened this season and what happened since 2011 that created the errors that New Brunswickers had to go through. But opposition leader Blaine Higgs says it's more than what he's calling a property tax scandal. We've gone well beyond a property tax scandal. We've gone to an absolute credibility scandal where the Premier not only won't take ownership and responsibility, but, but he, uh, he's basically, you know, uh, refusing to answer uh, the role he played in it. Higgs says the Premier resigning would be a start, but he'd also be fine with an early election call. Adrian says Global News. Fredericton. This is our kitchen. And uh, this is where we eat. This is our cooking for our fire. For Terry Sapir, a Ballistaquay grandmother, this is how she's spending her summer. One of at least eight people currently living at this camp. So that would be our shower. Which also happens to be the proposed future site of where the Sisson Mine Tailings Pond will go. We've been coming out here and camping for the last three years looking for permanent campsites so that we can use this land and keep it protected from development. She says the plan is to build more permanent homes all over the area. That's where a lot of the people are. You don't see them here, but they're out clearing their sites and uh, and getting ready to put their camps in. Now, people I spoke with here said they want to be very clear that this is not a protest, but them exercising their right to live here on this land. And while they say they're not against industry, they don't want to see it at the expense of future generations. Nick Polches is also living at the site. It's not a protest, but like 
if they're trying to, if like we are trying to use this area, all of it. Before the project received federal environmental approval in June, the province reached an accommodation agreement with six Maliseet chiefs, sharing a projected 9.8 percent of provincial revenue, along with other royalties. Where is that agreement that was reached? What um, agreement? The accommodation agreement? What, what about it? All that says is that if the project goes through, the Malisi people will be accommodated in this fashion. The chiefs, when they signed that agreement, they didn't give consent or approval for the project. It was a hypothetical question that said, if it ever happens, this is what you're going to get out of it. Sapir says a solidarity caravan will be rolling in soon from Montreal and a grand council meeting will take place at the site as well. But for now, Sapir says they want to be left alone and free to live on their land and hopes it will deter investors from coming on board with the project. Adrian South Global News, Napadogan. Monroe says his client is relieved and says both constables have been back at work since February. He says if the appeal process is exhausted, the ban on evidence will be lifted. That appeal period expires in 30 days. The RCMP say there were more than a dozen collisions, but none of them serious. They say most of those happened in the northern part of the province. And while the roads are clear now, they're still reminding people to drive according to conditions. McFarland says residents are praising their communities for coming together during the ice storm, including grocery stores banding together to keep food safe. But he does say residents have expressed concern and frustration over the lack of communication. Developing news at this hour, four people have been found dead after a house fire in southwestern New Brunswick. Adrian South has been following the story for us and joins us now from St. George with the latest. Adrian. Ron, I'm here on South Street in St. George, and as you can see, the house behind me is taped off. RCMP have confirmed that four people died this afternoon in a fire. It happened shortly after 1230. Many of the women here say they didn't know Erin Robertson personally. Many of them showed up to the ride at her funeral. They say it's so important to remember members of their community who lost their lives on the road, and it serves as a constant reminder for bikers and for drivers that you can never be too careful. With the government's electronic prescription monitoring system going forward, experts say that will increase the number of people using illicit drugs, drugs that could contain amounts of deadly substances like fentanyl. There was no shortage of enthusiasm on the soccer field today in Fredericton. A surreal experience for many being taught by the likes of Christine Sinclair, Diana Matheson, Karina LeBlanc, and Rianne Wilkinson. It's kind of like, it's like, like shocking kind of. It's like, oh my gosh, like this is like actually happening. It was super cool because you've watched them play on TV your whole life. Like these girls have been playing on the Canada team since I was been, since I've been born, I think. So just getting to meet the people that you've been watching for your whole life, it's kind of like a dream that you never think is going to happen, but then it does. The IS4 program was created following the 2012 Olympic Games where the women won bronze. More than 240 people turned out for this weekend's event, which is a partnership with the Fredericton District Soccer Association. We've had uh, kids from Nova Scotia all over New Brunswick. Like I think, I think the furthest in Nova Scotia were kids from the South Shore. I know mean, we've got people from here this morning from Amherst, but we've had people from all over New Brunswick. I think we've had some PEI people in town as well. So, yeah, we've covered the Maritimes pretty well with, uh, with this weekend. But it wasn't just about new drills and soccer skills. The women also shared experiences of having been cut from teams themselves early in their playing careers. But you got to be bold and be you and own who you are and chase your dreams no matter what. Because we are living proof. But if you do that, anything's possible. And it wasn't all hard work on the pitch. These young athletes were also given a chance to get autographs and pictures, as well as hold some hardware. Our goal was to get as many kids across the country to touch the medal, hoping, hoping that they dream big and like start to want to be the next Olympians. Symbolism not lost on Phillips. To me, it represents like hard work and dedication pays off. And so I'll keep trying my best to get better every day and then maybe someday I'll be holding a medal. Olympic athletes giving back, hoping to inspire a future generation of players. Adrian South, Global News, Fredericton.